channel. Today I am working pastel on Clairefontaine pastel matte paper. So using some pan pastels for the background. I've masked out the actual subject itself and what I did was I um, sketched out the kingfisher on a separate piece of paper and then using a light box I created a mask out of frisk uh, masking film placed that on the pastel mat just so I didn't have to work really really delicately round the outline of the kingfisher so if any of this pastel goes on to the frisk it um, it doesn't matter you just peel the frisk it off and it leaves the silhouette of the kingfisher nice and clean underneath you don't have to work like that but it's just a way I like to work it means I've not got to be so careful okay so just using the pan pastels four different colors to create the out of focus background so the reference images that I was working from had nothing like this in the background this is just something I wanted to add to make it my own the actual kingfisher is made of, of a two or three yes yeah, three different photographs um, to make a composition that I found pleasing so that's just something I tend to do so using the pan pastels if nobody's used them before it's um, pastel pigment in like a little pan so it looks like a makeup compact they're quite expensive but they do last a long long time in actual fact I've had mine for about five years now I think and I've only ever had to replace the white so they do go a long long way so that's pan pastels for the background I could have used uh, different brands of soft pastel but for me, me this is just a way that I'm used to it's nice and easy it's relatively quick as well and I think I got the background done in about an hour and a half two hours something like that <coughs> excuse me so I'm applying the pan pastel with a soft tool and these tools you can buy them singularly or you can buy them as a set it's like a plastic spatula a bit like a palette knife it feels like palette knife painting actually when you're using these and they've got a little foam sock on the end that's removable the little foam socks last about one per painting I would think you can use them on separate paintings different paintings you can wash them between paintings as well but for me they tend to wear out roughly towards the end of a painting depending on how much they're being used so you can buy the tools, the little sponges, you can just buy as extras and keep you know, topping up your supply of the little sponges as needs be. I hope everybody's keeping well. It's uh, May the 19th, I think, today. Right, okay, so yeah, Clairefontaine Pastel Matte is the paper. Um, it's very thick. It takes a multitude of layers, which is great. This is my preferred paper now for working with pastel and I also work, like to work mixed media on this paper as well. It will take wet uh, mediums as well as dry. So you can use graphite, charcoal, obviously pastel, coloured pencil, um, acrylics, gouache, ink tents, don't ink tents. Um, so it really is a nice paper, comes in a variety of colours you can buy it in pads or you can buy the separate sheets I tend to buy the separate sheets and then just cut them down to what I need yes it does come, as a, does come in a lot of colours I'm mixing my words up now um, but I tend to just stick with um, greys and beiges okay now I've mixed up some gouache not for the faint hearted this and I'm just flicking some onto the background I could have done this with pastel but I just wanted to experiment I guess just in the mood to experiment so I thought some water spray would look nice done with some gouache 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 opaque watercolor so after that was dry I dried it off with a hair dryer and then I removed the frisket film and now I can work on the kingfisher itself if you'd like a more in-depth look at how I create bouquet backgrounds in pastel I do have a separate video on my YouTube channel. So if you'd like to have a look at that later, that'd be great. So working on the fish. So I decided I wanted a kingfisher that had been fishing. So I thought I'd put a little 
minnow or something in his mouth not quite sure what kind of fish this is but it's down to detail isn't it a lot of people will skip by especially beginners think well it's only the fish and want to concentrate on the kingfisher but when it's all in one composition it's nice to pay as much attention to one area of painting as it is to another that way you can get a nice balance um, this video is running at about an hour um, but the actual project took about nine or ten hours I guess just to guess I don't time myself so I used to when I first started doing commissions and things I had used to time myself just to see how long each piece took but now I don't bother time whizzes by when you're um, creating so I'd rather not be reminded of the amount of time I sit or stand at the easel and yes I do work in an upright position that's the artwork not me although I do yeah <laughs> so I like to work with my artwork on an easel as opposed to flat on a table or a board um, I do like st working standing up and sitting down I think standing up is better because I can keep stepping back having a look but um for those of you who follow me on social media, you'll know that I'm in the process of building a new studio. So I'm crammed into our spare bedroom at the minute with all of my art materials around me. Quite claustrophobic, actually. But uh, so I can stand up and step back, but can only step back about one and a half feet before I back up into a, a bookcase. So, uh, yeah. OK, so on with the fish. So lots of layers started off with the darks we actually had to pop a few lights in as well so i didn't lose them and then just working some different colors in and just building the layers up this clairefontaine pastel matte paper will take loads and loads and loads of layers if you touch it it feels like cork so it feels like it won't take a lot of layers and it doesn't feel sandy or anything like that but it does it takes a multitude of layers and that's why I like it so I worked on the fish for a while popped in some colors some grays a little bit of blue pink around the gills remember that you know every single part of a wildlife painting you're thinking of anatomy you're thinking of structure as well as composition contrast and color so it all comes to play and if I had a video of time in, uh, filming me, sorry, in the st in the studio space, um, you would notice that I do go backwards and forwards to different parts of a painting as the painting progresses, and that's just to balance out the painting. So it, I don't think it shows it within this video because it would just be <laughs> there'd be too much footage of me sort of standing staring at my picture doing nothing or just fiddling about with little tiny areas but I do switch backwards and forwards between different parts of the painting that's part of the the process that I go through that's how I work so into the beak I've turned the board on its side just to make it easier for me I like to have my working surface on a board that I can easily rotate around on the easel just so I can be in the optimum position working position so I'm nice and relaxed, I'm not having to bend my arm around in weird um, <clears throat> directions. I did have a shoulder issue a few years ago, I definitely don't want that back. So whatever is easiest to me, I go, I go for that. So yes, I do rotate the board quite a bit when I'm working. Hopefully I don't rotate it too much during this video. So yeah, if you're working at home and you're finding an area of painting or a drawing harder to get to, just if you can, just turn your painting around, even if it means working upside down sometimes. A lot of times that's actually easier because it makes your brain think of more abstract shapes. I could be looking at this beak and if I was having difficulty, my brain's just trying to make everything look like a bird's beak. But if you, I'm just showing you some pencils that I'm using for the beak there. But if you just trust your reference image, trust your techniques and just go with the flow. And if you if you do have a good reference image to work from, trust that that's true to life and paint what you see and not what you think you can see. Using a blending stump there, that just pushes the pigment further into the paper. 
and that way you can keep applying more and more layers on top. Keep pushing the pigment down and then applying more. The great thing about pastel is you can work light to dark and dark to light. Now I did use a variety of pastel pencil brands in this piece. I used Creticolor, Daily and Rowney, a few Derwent and a couple of Carbothellos. So part the Derwent comes across as a soft, a softer pastel pencil. So not, you know, you're less likely to hold a longer point, a sharpened point for very long. Whereas the Creticolor, De La Rowney and the Carbothello do hold a point for longer because they're a slightly harder pigment. I do have the full, I'm, I'm very blessed, I do have the full sets of all of them, but um, I have worked with a lot of companies in the past and they've been generous in giving me their, their supplies. Um, current company I'm working with is Derwent. I'm a Derwent ambassador at the moment. They've been sending me extra supplies and I will be getting around to trying the new supplies out and making videos and reviews and things. Hopefully once I'm into my new studio it'll be a lot easier. So just tightening up some of the edges. And when I'm working with pastels, I do tend to leave tidying the edges right till the very end because as you're applying pastels, some of the edges can become a bit looser looking, we'll say. Not, not so much blurry, but a little bit looser, a looser look about them. And it is nice with um, feathers and fur that you can leave it looking soft. But when it comes to things like beaks, nails, teeth, anything like that. Sharpening edges I do tend to leave towards the end of a painting. So I'll get to sort of 90% or 95% through a painting, go make a coffee, come back and then with fresh eyes have a look, see what needs tidying up. So there was a multitude of colours used in the beak, purples, pinks, magentas, uh, warm greys and cool greys and remembering the shadows and remembering the form of a bird's beak um, to create things that aren't necessarily that visible on a reference image. And the reference image for this was okay. It was sort of 75% clear, but um, knowing a little bit about wildlife anatomy, birds included, I was able just to put in a little few extras that weren't actually in the reference image. I've just popped in some base coats of the orange and just put in some light green in across the top of the bird's head. Now you can work as I said light to dark, dark to light, but it is nice to get some of your lighter areas in so they don't muddy and by that I mean that they don't mix with a colour that's laid underneath. It keeps the, the colours a little bit more fresh. So keep if, if at any point during the video it looks like I'm pausing, it, it's just that I'm looking at the reference image. I have it on the iPad towards the left of my easel. That might change when I move into the new studio. It might be on my right or I might keep it on my left. I haven't decided yet. And I've got marks all over my hands. Um, it probably gets worse as the video gets goes on, but I've been as obviously working in the studio, cutting wood, drilling and things, and I do have a few war wounds <laughs> on my hand. So sorry if it's off-putting, but needs be, needs must. Doing all the work myself, so need, needs must. Little bit more orange going on. I have popped in a little bit of black gouache where the eye is going to be and I could have gone in with black pastel but going on with the lighter colours after that you do run the run the risk of muddying your highlights so I thought I was play safe and it's a it's a convenient way of working for me popped a little bit of gouache in went down made a coffee come back up the gouache was dry and I could just carry on 
so working in different greens. Now it's easy to look at a kingfisher photograph and think oh they're just turquoise blue and orange and yeah that I mean when one flies by you if you if you're lucky to see one when you're out walking um, it you do just get this flash of orange and turquoise in actual fact it's a memory that takes me right back to my childhood but I won't bore you with that now <laughs> but uh, remember that those colors are made up from lots and lots of different feathers and the sun will be hitting or the light source will be hitting those different feathers highlighting some um, casting others into shadow and just remember that when you're creating artwork whether it be fur or feathers or scales or even fish skin you know the light's going to be hitting at certain points and that will have an effect on how the the light is cast across the um, subject so as I said I've put the lights in now putting some darks in and then I'll go in between and I can either blend it out if I don't like it or work with it if I do um, every painting I'm sure I'm not on my own here but every time I start a new painting for f the first couple of seconds that I go to paint whether it be graphite or oils acrylics inks it's like I've never sort of worked with artwork before <clears throat> excuse me it's a really weird feeling happens majority of times I start an, a new painting but after those few seconds once I've started I just get into the zone and it's wonderful but it is um, a learning process for everybody I, I believe who creates every painting is going to be different to the last painting even if I was to create the same painting twice, I would probably go about it slightly different each time. And it's just a process. Pick up a colour. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, put it down. Pick up another colour. And the same with mixing colours when working in oils or acrylics or watercolours. If one colour doesn't work, um, use it a little bit and then mix another colour and see how that goes and that way that learning process like I said is unique it's different for every single painting that I create so he's looking like he's going through a bit of an ugly stage at the minute obviously I've got the I've to, for you I've got the finished painting to the top left hand corner so you can actually see where I'm heading with this painting Obviously, I've not got that to look at when, when I'm working on uh, my artworks. Uh, lots of imagery of kingfishers over on unsplash.com and pixabay.com. So if you want to have a go at creating your own painting or drawing or sketch of a kingfisher, there's a multitude of images over on those two sites that you can go and get. They're all royalty free, which means you can use them in your own artwork. You can sell your own artwork and uh, things like that. There's no copyright involved, which is great. Great for artists. Um, if you're fortunate enough to own a decent camera and live in a suitable location, then it's great to actually go out, take your own uh, reference images and work from those. And I think working from your own reference images, you do tend to learn a lot more about things like composition and things. I think it's relatively easy these days to go on to um, a photographic site such as Pixabay or Unsplash and choose a photograph that is already compositionally correct, as it were, where you look at it and you know that it looks right. But in that case, are you really learning anything about composition? And I don't think you are. I think it's better to take a photograph, um, get back home, sketch from the photograph and then create your own composition. I think you learn a lot more that way. And there's plenty of videos on YouTube uh, regarding composition and things like that as well. So... I wanted to create a sense of movement in this piece and capture the bird with quite a bit of contrast as well. Now the reference images that I was working from all had 
green watery backgrounds they were very blur <laughs> they were very flat looking the backgrounds were I just wanted to add, add a little bit of zing to the background not so much that it would overtake the subject though so again just finding that nice balance um, some of the colors used in the background I introduce into the subject itself even though they're not in the reference image images and that ties the two together as well. What I didn't want to do is create the outer focus background, then create the kingfisher, and, and the kingfisher looked like it had just been cut and pasted onto the background. I did, didn't want that. I don't like to see that in any works and definitely not in my own. So general rule um, for myself is to pull colors from the background into the subject and vice versa especially if you're doing a foreground as well I like the same colors to be somewhere in the composition running through all the different depths of field um, in the finished project so this video is running at about just over an hour I believe hour and nine I think it's showing me at the moment so I will ramble it on a little bit more any questions please pop them in the comments below I do answer everybody's questions and if there's anything you'd like me to cover in future videos please let me know as well whether that's subjects or mediums or if you want me to create a video about composition or creating more contrast creating more contrast is, is quite simplistic it means getting your darks darker and your lights lighter so the contrast between the two becomes greater and that adds to a sense of realism and it does catch people's eyes more than all the colours, really. I'm sharpening my pastel pencils. I like to remove the wood, the um, outer wood casing of the pencil is using a knife, a Stanley blade and then I sharpen the pigment itself on fine sandpaper and there's a video about that as well on my YouTube channel if you'd like to take a look I created this Kingfisher painting for this month's workshop I run uh, monthly workshops in Cheshire here in the UK um, alternating them between watercolour and pastel so I'll have watercolour one month pastel the following month and so on and all of the workshops are wildlife based and they are at Martin Mir Wetland Centre in Lancashire and 50% of the proceeds goes straight back into conversa conversation conservation I don't think I've had enough coffee today <laughs> So blending tool again, these blending stumps, they're, they're absolutely brilliant for blending colours together and as I said, pushing pigment down into the tooth of the paper. And all I do, if I've worked on a darker area with the blending stump, I just wipe it clean on a piece of tissue. I never try to sharpen them because they'll go all ragged and they'll fray. Um, just keep some for dark colours, some for light colours. And when they start wearing out, when they when they do do start getting a little bit rough textured, just pop them into your recycling bag and pick up a new one. And they're relatively cheap. You can get a bag of ten for about three three or four pounds from Amazon. You can make your own, uh, but I've never tried that. It's just rolled paper. That's all. It is tightly rolled paper. So going on with different greys, bringing in those light greys as well as and some warm greys. A little bit of lemon colour going on there. I don't know the names of these colours. In actual fact, I think the Creta colours. Is it the Creta colours? I know some of them have only got numbers on them. They're, oh no, I think the Creta colours are named. But some of the colours, I think it's the Dale Rowney then. I've just got numbers on and I just pick up what I think I need and if it doesn't work I just put it down and pick up another colour. If you do accidentally use a colour that's quite obvious that it shouldn't be there um, 
if you can remove it fine if you can't remove it it doesn't matter just put that color somewhere else in the picture as well and if you use um, the wrong color she said in averted inverted um, comma things um, if you use the wrong color in one place in a painting pop it into a, um, a couple more places in the painting and it will look like you've done it deliberately and then it wasn't a mistake but as long as you're I mean if your painting needs a yellow try and figure out to start off with does it need a cool yellow or a warm yellow so does it need a color um, of yellow that's more to the green side on a color wheel or does it need a yellow more to the warm side you know closer to an orange and that's a starting point with any color really if you see you need a blue or a green try and figure out is it a cool one or is it a warm one is it a cool blue so does it lean more towards one side of a color wheel or does it lean more to another side of a color wheel blues for instance do they look more purpley or do they look more green <clears throat> excuse me that way it narrows down your your choice making then it's easier to choose a color if you know which way it's leaning um, warm or cool and if your painting requires any black in it at all um, I never like to use flat black because it will always look flat if you want to use a black put an undercoat of a warm color such as a burnt umber or a reddish brown and then put your black on top and that will make your black look warm it'll make your black look deeper if you want a cool black in your painting put a base coat down of maybe purple or blue and that will tend to shift your black and make it look cooler so I don't like to use black just on its own because it it can alter the look of a whole painting if you're not careful obviously with the black gouache I placed on the eye to begin with that was just flat black but I knew I was going to layer other colors on top of it so that worked out okay and the same with white um, we all you know you see birds and, and animals you know different things in wildlife that have a lot of white on them but white's a very reflective color so it will be reflecting the colors around it um, whether that's part of the animal's anatomy that it's reflecting or the environment and you just need to think about that when you're applying white as well so you don't just want a big splodge of white and just leave it at just a as pure white because it won't look right so you can mix in if you want your white to look warm you can mix in light tones of yellows and oranges if you want your white to look cool then you can mix in light blues and lilacs now when you're shadowing yellows and oranges like i am here um, it's so easy isn't it to pick up a dark gray or black but black and yellow can sometimes make green and it's not a nice green it's sort of a muddy green especially if you're working with paints so what I like to do is if I'm shadowing yellows and oranges I like to use a magenta for that it doesn't have to be really really dark magenta just pick up a magenta a little bit of shadowing then that with that and then a few yellow or orange highlights on top and it just livens everything up I'm not trying to create every single feather I don't know how many feathers there are on a kingfisher's head I don't want to count them I won't have time to um, do them one at a time I just want a sense of all of the feathers going in the right direction and the right sized feathers in that part of the anatomy back up to the beak a little bit there as I said I do skip backwards and forwards between different parts of the painting just going to have a drink so working on the feathers on the top of the head um, you saw in an earlier part of the video that I was putting all the highlights in and then I, I just worked 
in between the highlights creating some depth by using different greens and different turquoise blues and just mixing them up mixing and matching until I got the look that I wanted there's no science in it it's just an illusion we, we're trying to create something that looks 3d on on a 2d basis on a sheet of paper that's all it is and if it goes wrong it's just a piece of paper with some art materials on you can start again so push through the ugly area there's not a lot you can do with pastel that you can't rectify if you do go wrong but if you do get to the stage where maybe your paper won't take any more pastel maybe you've overworked an area or you've filled the tooth you could try lifting some out some pigment out with a putty rubber if that doesn't work and you really do feel like you need to start again then that's fine you've not lo you might have lost a sheet of paper and a little bit of pastel pigment but you'll be learning and that's that's the main thing with every single painting you're going to learn something whether it works well or whether it doesn't work well you're still learning and hopefully you know what might be a mistake on on one painting might work really well on something else because we will get happy accidents as well so just don't be afraid to try a lot of people are put off doing backgrounds because they're afraid of getting it wrong to find backgrounds too hard well in that case get the background in first and then everything's a bonus after that once you've worked on a background and you're happy with it if you're more comfortable working on the actual subject then that's going to be a breeze after tackling a background but if you do find backgrounds unsettling then these out of focus backgrounds they're so simple um, nobody can tell you they look wrong because it's an out of focus background then each one's going to look completely different but it's a nice way of getting a background into a painting and then being able to just concentrate on the subject on some paintings especially in acrylics and oils I do do more uh, detailed backgrounds but for something like this little kingfisher study I didn't want anything to pull the viewers eyes away from the action that's actually happening with the subject itself so getting some darks in around those lighter areas on that part of the kingfisher and here comes the magenta again for a little bit of shadowing the Creta Colour pencils, the De La Rana pencils and the Carbothello pencils, their hardness is very, very similar. <coughs> Excuse me. As I said, the Derwent pencils are slightly softer and the leads are slightly larger. So they're great if you want to cover a larger piece of the paper. But for finer detailed areas, I do like to go in with the, the other three brands. I also have pit pastels as well. I'm 57 this year and my dad bought me my pit pastels when I was 14 and I still have a lot of, lot of them and they're still going strong. They're very thick lead as well and very soft, very much like the Derwent's. So I've swizzled the board, if that's a real word, swizzled the board back round to um, the normal position. Um, pulled my glassine paper across so I can rest my hand on it and then started on these flight feathers. So this is one thing that I did want to be um, aware of when I was creating this Kingfisher painting is how many primary feathers, you know, the, the flight feathers, how many secondary feathers. I wanted to make sure I got the the amount correct on my initial sketch and then because these are bigger feathers obviously you can count them i was actually counting them. i don't know if you saw that i was counting with my pencil then making sure i was uh, putting the white onto the correct amount of feathers so just base coats very rough when you're putting in base coats make sure you're going in, in the correct direction so if it's a, a furry animal, make sure you go in with the direction of the, the, that the fur would lie. You can always think of it as if you were stroking that animal, which way would you want your hand to go 
so you didn't ruffle the fur. Same with feathers, go in the direction of the feathers. If it's a leaf or anything like that, go in the direction of the veins of the leaf. And that way, if any hard lines occur in the base coats, they won't look out of place because they'll be going in the correct direction anyway. And subsequent layers will often cover them. I've just had a, a little like and subscribe pop up just to remind me to, to say if you are enjoying my videos then please like and subscribe to my channel. It does help the uh, algorithm <laughs> that nobody really understands but liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing all help with the algorithms and if you like it, like and subscribe. It tells the algorithm to show other people as well because they might want to watch it and then they might like to like and subscribe too. So building up some darks on top and I do go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, light to dark, dark to light until I've just got the sheen of the feather that, that I want. So the first layers as you can see where it's just the white it looks quite patchy but that's fine because that's just the base coat going on and then as you build up subsequent layers the surface becomes smoother it's then that you can if you're not careful fill the tooth of the paper but as long as your layers are nice and thin you can build up a multitude of layers in actual fact I've never ran out of tooth on the Clairefontaine pastel paper working like this so that's good. So again, not using white on its own, but using it with a variety of other shades. So warm greys and cool greys. And just constantly thinking, where would the light be hitting these feathers? What would be in shadow? Bringing some colour down the feather there, a little bit of emerald green. Excuse me. And even if that colour isn't in the photograph, I like to add it be just a little bit of um, gives it a little bit of life. A little bit of highlighting going on there. Some warm grey. If you're going dark, just go dark on a painting gradually because it's always easier to add more but it can be sometimes tricky if you've gone too dark and then you want to bring a certain area of a painting back to being really light. That can be a little bit troublesome but if you gradually build up your darks it's much easier. And pastels aren't as opaque as you'd think they are so yeah L less is more just build it up gradually you can see some of the uh, gouache spatter there on the background that I did earlier across the bottom third of the painting and if you don't like doing spatter with gouache or anything like that if you because it is very random it, it, it could land anywhere I've probably got some on my monitor as well but because <laughs> it just flicks uh, bigger brush bigger splatters smaller brush smaller splatters you can use um, a toothbrush things like that but it's very very random um, if that's not for you then if you want to do water splashes then you can actually use a pointed you know sharpen your white pastel pencil to a really fine point and then just pop that on instead and that way you you'll have uh, you'll know where the spots are going then I obviously like to live life dangerously <laughs> so we've got the um, primary feathers in now doing the secondaries and these are sl looking slightly different to the outstretched front feathers so again working from the the main line of each feather I don't actually know the name of that like the main vein I don't know what it's called actually Ooh, I'll have to look that one up um, working from that away away from the midsection of the feather to the edge 
uh, diagonally, so how the filaments come away from the centre of each feather. You can't really see it up close, but I know it's there, and I, it just gives an element of movement in the feathers instead of just being um, a panel of colour running straight down. And obviously I've turned my board again just to make it easier. I think I was standing up doing the um, the wing so I could keep stepping back and having a, a quick look. The glassine paper, if you don't, if you don't have glassine um, and you don't know anything about it, I think it used to be called butcher's paper. The one I buy is by Clefontaine who make the pastel matte paper and what it is it's a semi-transparent paper that is acid free and it just doesn't pick up anything. I can lay a sheet of that across charcoal and it doesn't even pick up or smudge that and it just keeps my hands from smudging my artwork, it keeps the oils from my hands interfering with my products um, and then when you go to store your artworks whether they be acrylics or charcoal, graphite, pastels, inks, whatever I just lay a sheet of glassine between each piece of artwork and it just protects the artwork from any disturbance. So that's glassine paper. I'll try and remember to link everything in the description below. So painting background now to um, normal orientation. I couldn't think of the word then. And back on with some of this emerald green. Now this emerald green pencil I think is a Dale Rowney and it's, it's quite a hard pastel pencil, this particular colour. And that was nice because I could get a little bit of a feeling of the filaments when I was making the um, angular marks, the diagonal marks. Again, just giving the sense of texture. There's no physical texture to, to pastels. So all your texture has got to be created by pencil strokes or pastel strokes uh, if you're working with soft pastels. If I wanted to work something like this in just soft pastels and utilising no pastel pencils at all, I would want to work a lot bigger, maybe four times bigger. Because getting a point on a soft pastel is a lot harder than getting a point on a pencil. But then again, working with pastel pencils is a lot slower than working with just soft pastels. So you've just got to you know balance balance things out how much time have you got to create a project if you've not got a lot of time create smaller projects uh, you know we can all get burnout because I move from one painting as soon as I finish one painting I'm straight on to my next one whether that's artwork for up-and-coming exhibitions artwork for workshops uh, commissions gallery work and now for Derwent I've always got something lined up ready to go on to these or next so time you know it's a time thing as as well as you know having the amount of room that I need thankfully the new studio because it's a garage conversion so the new studio is just slightly smaller than the original garage is going to be big obviously so I'm going to have lots of room to work on bigger projects which I am missing to be quite honest this is probably you know the normal size for me now this kingfisher for the simple reason is I've not got the room to maneuver large boards or large canvases around at the minute so and storing them obviously is a, an issue at the minute as well so as soon as I'm in the new studio I'm hoping to get cracking on some bigger projects too So finish with the lower part of the wing for now because <laughs> I probably will pop backwards and forwards between that and the rest of the bird. And now just laying down some base coats. Now I could have gone in with pan pastel to lay down this base coat but I didn't want to feel too much of the tooth of the paper because I know, know there's a not detail as such but a lot of texture to add. And so I want to save the tooth of the paper 
for the amount of layers that I know I want to add during the painting process. That's something I think that comes with practice is knowing how many layers you're going to need. You won't know exactly, I don't know exactly, but you'll have a rough idea whether it's going to be just a couple of layers or nearer to 10 layers. Keeping that in mind um, allows me to concentrate on what product I need to use at any given time. So if I was only going, like the background was only sort of two layers really, um, I knew I could use the pan pastels to get the out of focus background look. I knew that I wasn't having to go on to put any detail on top of that. So a softer pastel was quicker, um, but obviously it fills the tooth the, of the paper quickly as well. Uh, using the blending stump to blend everything together and to push the pigment down into the tooth of the paper. And that allows me to come back with the pastel pencils again and start building up the texture in the feathers. As I said, I'm not going to sit and draw every single feather. I just want a sense of there are feathers there. They're this length or that length. They're going in this direction or that direction. They're coloured with these colours, with these highlights, with these shadows, but not every single feather is needed. The bigger you go, um, or definitely for me, the, the bigger the painting, the more detail I do, I do like to put in. So if I was to do this a lot bigger, then it would be nice to get some really detailed references or pop to the museum and take some photographs of um, taxidermid specimens, things like that, and then be able to create a painting yeah, with every single feather in, because I, I must admit I'm a bit of a detail freak. I do like painting and drawing detail, but you've got to draw the line somewhere working uh, when you're working on small paintings and drawings. So on with some blues. So I've got quite a few greens and blues going in. Remembering where the highlights are going, so I don't want to lose those and I don't want to lose the small sketched shapes that I've got underneath. And remember when feathers are overlapping other feathers, remember the shadow. So the, the primary flight feathers are actually going under those feathers that I'm doing at the moment. That's why I did those ones first, because these are going to be the, the ones I'm working on now are overlapping. So it, you're more or less working from the back of the painting to the front of the painting. It makes life so much easier. That's why I tend to do backgrounds first as well. And I do know some artists that actually leave backgrounds to the end, but uh, that's not a way that I like to work. So a little bit of um, shadowing going in there. Don't just use black for, for shadows. Use a darker value of whatever colour you're using. So if, if you've done um, a blue petal, two blue petals, say, and they're overlapping each other and there's a shadow on the lower one, it might be tempting to pick up a black and, and pop a little black shadow in there, but then that's going to look flat, even though there might be blue underneath it. and So it will look a cool black, but it will still look a bit flat. Instead, you could go in with a dark blue or a dark purple and then start mixing those and you'll find you'll get a much more interesting shadow than just using black. Oh, another wound on, on my hand, look at that, right near my knuckle. And I've still got that now, it's only just healing up. <laughs> War wounds, DIY wounds. <laughs> Back in with the greens again. This was a really nice subject to work on, it was lovely. Really enjoyed that. I mean, I enjoy, nine times out of ten, I enjoy all of my paintings and drawings and commissions and sketches and everything but this was really lovely it is a subject that I adore I love kingfishers they 
uh, when I was little, I uh, used to be over the fields with the dogs and down by the river, kingfishers and kestrels and it was wonderful and kingfishers bring back lovely memories. They're a fantastic bird. If you ever get the chance to sit in a bird hide um, with a pair of binoculars and just watch them, They're, they are fascinating little birds, wonderful and pretty too, very pretty and fast. <laughs> So more of the same, developing some of the little feathers there that are standing out, but not in, a, not in great detail, just making the viewer aware that there are feathers there to be seen. More singular feathers because of the size than a, a dense covering of tiny feathers. And as you can see in the finished painting, it the the bird and the background there's a lot more blue than is showing on the actual video the lighting that I use I, I have two sets of lighting one is directly over the easel uh, by it's a I'll put them in I'll put the description of the lighting in the description of the video um, they're by the daylight company they're easel lights um, and also have a set of those exactly the same but over my art materials so normally have the art materials to the right hand side of me and as I said my iPad on a monitor to the left so I have one set of lighting attached to the table where my materials are and one set of lighting attached to the top of my easel just so both items the easel the work on the easel and the materials are lit exactly the same. If they're not, then it can be quite, um, not disorientating, but it can be quite confusing sometimes that if you look at your art materials and pick up a certain colour blue, and if that's not lit the, as, uh, as your easel is, when you bring it over to your easel, um, it can look a little bit different. So it is nice to have both areas lit the same. If you're unable to um, get any lighted set up like that just make sure whatever lighting is in your room are daylight bulbs and then your colours should look true, true to life. There's nothing worse than working on a painting or a drawing under artificial light and then looking it, at it the next day in da natural daylight and seeing colours you didn't even realise you'd put in there and it's just because um, some light bulbs throw off a warmer light, some throw off a cooler light and it can just distort the colours that you're choosing for your paintings and drawings. Tiny bit of detail going in there, that's more so that I don't lose where those little feathers are. They are visible in the finished painting but um, it's, it's not really detailed detail. I've not outlined each feather and done each feather as an individual. I'm sort of blending them together with a little bit of shadowing and things like that. So making them stand out but only by the use of shadowing really and not outlining them. Don't outline feathers <laughs> unless you're going for that look obviously. That would be a stylized look. There's nothing wrong in that if that's the aim that you're going for. Just getting a drink again. Another, we're going back to time. The the I know that um, YouTube videos can make everything look so quick, and you'll watch um, somebody, I don't know, paint a landscape, and it. The video is over and done with within 15 minutes and you think oh I'll sit down tonight and do one of those and then you start and that's then you realize how long things actually take uh, when you're watching these videos if the artist hasn't said how many how fast um, the recording is being played at and you think you'd like to have a go at something similar it's always worth dropping a comment uh, below the video and saying 
actually, you know, realistically, how long would this take? And it gives you a rough idea because it can be disheartening, I think, especially for, get for beginners when they watch a YouTube video, see something completed in 15 minutes, and then they start doing something of their own in a similar vein. And, you know, three hours later, and they're not even a quarter of the way through. It's It can be disheartening. Just remember that art takes time, and different artists work at different speeds as well. And it doesn't say anything about an artist. If they're fast or slow, it doesn't make them better or worse artists. It's just everybody is completely different. So be realistic about the, the amount of time you set aside to create paintings and drawings. If you only have half an hour a day, as long as you're creating artwork for half an hour a day, you'll improve. Your projects will get finished. It just might take a little bit longer than if you had an hour a day. Um, and, you know, get some you time. And if you've got space in your house just to, or in a room, just to set up some art equipment that you can actually leave set out, do it. Because there's nothing worse. And I've been there years ago having to work from a dining room table and after every session, every painting session, every drawing session, I was having to pack everything away. And it's really, really difficult. Um, if you can just get a corner of a room, even if it's a little, you know, one of these little tables that you, some people have their dinners on, just something, if you can get something that can be set up and left. Maybe your children have left home and you now have a spare bedroom. Or you have a conservatory where you can just set up a little easel or a little table and a fold away chair if you can leave your art materials out you're more likely to use them and you're more likely to use them more often um, that's something to think about um, if you're not very mobile then maybe one of these little dinner trays the lap trays get a couple of those with some art materials on just so you only have to lean down to the side of you and pick that up and put it on your knee and you, you're ready to go. Uh, because there's nothing worse than feeling motivated, feeling inspired to create and then having to spend half an hour just getting your materials out and set up. It can be really uh, demoralising and that is time when you could be creating. And there's always time for art. Even if you've only got a few minutes, just pick up um, a piece of paper and a ballpoint pen while you're waiting for dinner to cook and just doodle. And you'll be really surprised. You know, if you do that, get into the habit of doing that 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, you'd be surprised. Um, your creativity increases. The more you do, the more you'll want to do. Um, yeah, and if you if you feel like you've lost the inspiration or you've lost the motivation um we call it artist block and it's real i mean i create nearly every day i paint or draw nearly every day if i don't then i i, I know about it i feel different within myself um but if you're feeling like you should be creating you want to create but you're not inspired just draw something draw anything just Sit down and look around the room, draw a chair, you know, draw a mug of coffee. Because as soon as you start to create, the motivation will come back. If, you just, if you're just sitting, I don't know, playing on a computer game or reading the newspaper or what a lot of us do now, scrolling through our phones, it's, I doubt very much that you're going to be inspired by doing that you might see other people's artwork and think oh I should be doing that but if you actually start to do something draw or sketch anything an apple a banana anything go in your fridge and get some tomatoes and chop them up and draw one of those just something like that and as soon as you start you'll feel the inspiration and motivation come back I always feel inspired and motivated when I'm not able to draw. I might be driving down the motorway and see a kestrel hovering or something like that. And I'll think, oh, I could just sit and paint one of those. And, and I think that is typical 
when we haven't got the time or we're not in the right place to to create that's sometimes when your brain thinks oh you could be doing that now or you don't you want to do that now <laughs> so make time and make the opportunity for you to be inspired and motivated and if you've got a group of friends that like to create if you can't do it on a weekly basis how about having a chat with your friends and saying why don't we once a month sit in the local park maybe and draw or you could take it in turns going around to each other's homes and having a, a craft evening or a painting evening or an afternoon once a month or even once every two months if you can't do it you know once a week or anything like that there's always a way where there's a will there's a way so that was a Carbothello pastel pencil and back in with a Creta colour Creta colour Creta colour don't know how you're supposed to um, say that name now we're working dark over light and I'm not working individual feathers now I'm just working texture because these feathers would be laying relatively flat to the body now the birds taken off out of the water and they're also at um, a shallower angle from the viewer the ones on the back so we'd really be just seeing the edges of the feathers on the birds back as it goes away from the viewer little more of the dark areas going in um, building shape and just adding a little bit of the water the water isn't included um, in this video because it's very random just applying lights and darks in I can't even say random patterns because there's no pattern there really just following the um, reference image to a certain extent and then making the rest up if you want me to produce a video just on water I will do that's not a problem there's plenty of photos um, on unsplashing pixabay of water droplets hitting water and the water coming up out of a cup or and things like that I'll be more than happy to create a video just on water but this was kingfisher in pastel so I just concentrated on the kingfisher filming the kingfisher for this video but adding color the colors into the water that would make it look a little bit more interesting and those colors are definitely not in the reference image and going very loose around the edges of the tail feathers because i wanted the tail feathers to actually look like they were still um, enveloped as it were in the water around them but just working dark to light light to dark blending the colours together where needs be layering up nice thin layers very very light hand nowhere on this painting did I have to apply pressure as such um, pastels are very very soft you let the paper texture pick up and catch the pastel you don't have to dig in with, or you shouldn't have be having to dig in with the pastel pencil that would be the quickest way to fill your tooth and then the paper won't allow you to add any more so a light hand always I don't know if that really shows up on these videos that how lighter pressure I'm actually using that is why I do like to run workshops because you can actually see what people are doing you can see how they're holding pencils how much pressure they're applying and it may be you know they might have struggled for years and it might be something as simple as just apply less pressure when you're putting your pastel on what's the worst that can happen you have to apply two coats instead of one it could be something that simple that can be holding people back from progressing further with their artwork it's the same with painting you know how 
much pressure to put on a paintbrush how are you holding your paintbrush are you holding it you know way up the uh, barrel of the paintbrush or too close to the the filaments it's um yeah workshops are great and you can convey a lot more than than just me rambling doing a voiceover over one of my videos I'm afraid but I hope this gives you a good idea of how I work um, and a little insight into how I teach I guess I don't like to call it teaching I just like to call it with students in, I like to inspire them and, and, and encourage them and then the helps there when they need it I'm self-taught so I didn't do art college or anything like that just self-taught from about the age of four so we had a big wildlife garden and my mum can remember me being down there and over the fields with the dogs from around the age of four down the garden from around the age of seven over the fields and I would just sit and draw and paint everything I saw um, butterflies and frogs and newts snakes and toads and different flowers different insects and that's where my artistic career I guess developed from that's where it came from did my first commission at 14 yeah been a wonderful journey since and hopefully many many years to come so going in with a black just a little bit, tiny bit. As I said earlier on, if you put in black and yellow together, just be really careful because you can get a really, it's, I can't even say it's an olive green, it's sort of a muddy, muddy olive green. So yeah, just be careful if you do go near yellow with black. Back in with the magenta. As I said earlier, I use magenta. I like to use magenta for shading yellows and oranges. Just toning down those um, lighter feathers around the edge there. Just when working through something like this, you've got to remember what would be in shade and, and where would the light be catching. So those feathers on the tops of his legs would actually be hidden slightly by the tail feathers. And keeping the highlights um, to a minimum if they are in an area where it would be in shade, obviously, because it wouldn't be catching the sunlight or anything like that. So just a couple more minutes to go to the end of this one. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, I have another huge video that I need to start editing. That's a toucan in Derwent Ink Tents, but that's going to be an undertaking. That is a long video, so I'll get that edited down. Hope you're all keeping well, as I said earlier. And I hope everyone stays safe. Stay creative. Join me on social media. I'm on uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. I've got a Facebook personal page and a Facebook business page as well. Uh, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. And please feel free to share my videos uh, with your friends on Facebook, etc. In with some highlights there. And my website, if you want to have a look at um, other finished artworks that I've done, the website is www.kerrynewell.com. I'll link it in the description below. Pop in some more highlights on. And there you have him, Kingfisher in pastel with a little bit of gouache for a spattering effect. Stay safe, everybody. Stay creative. And I'll see you all soon. Bye for now.